All right, I will call the meeting to order. Everybody stand for the pledge, please. Can't hear you. Oh, do we hear it? The mayor did call the meeting. Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America and to the republic for which it's one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. Clerk, take the roll. Mayor O'Connor? Here. Morissette? Here. Wakefield? Here. Knudsen? Here. Kennedy? Here. Brock? Here. Hall? Here. All right, uh, I'm having, uh, I'm using a couple different devices here and I'm having a hard time loading uh, the agenda. So Aaron is going to uh, take over in a second. First of all, I did want to say, I don't know as, uh, if anybody is in the audience tonight uh, to, uh, to listen in on the subject of the additional liquor licenses. I just wanted to add that what we're going to do tonight is just do a first reading. Uh, I will not entertain a motion to suspend the rules to bypass the first reading. And then we will take the issue up in the second meeting in May. So if anybody is in the audience that is uh, is waiting for that issue to come up, uh, that's what's going to happen. There will be no decision on that tonight. And if you want to sit and listen and watch the uh, rest of the meeting, feel free. Otherwise, if you wanted to take off, that's fine, too. Thank you. So, Aaron, go ahead. And by the way, thanks, everybody, for indulging me once again on Zoom. Um, and it uh, worked pretty well before, but this must be one really big package to download. So <laughs> if, it does, if it does download, Aaron, I'll let you know and I'll take over again. Okay, sounds good. So what we have next is comments and suggestions from citizens present. Um, comments are limited to five minutes, uh, must address items not listed on the agenda, and limited to issues that have an impact of the City of Hudson and that the Common Council may address at a future meeting um, and must not include endorsements of any candidates or any other electioneering. Um, exceptions may be made by the mayor um, uh, to the time uh, rule if uh, deemed necessary. Um, and these are limited to residents of the city of Hudson. So if anybody has any comments, please step forward. And remember, it's only for things that aren't on the agenda. So if you're here for the liquor thing, can't talk about that one. Are there any comments? Are there any comments? Are there any comments? Hearing none, we'll close that portion of the agenda. All right, moving on, we have uh, presentations. Um, so first up, we have the recognition of Jim Fry for receiving the 2023 Wisconsin Rural Water Operator of the Year Award. And Council President Morissette will take this. Come on up here, Mr. Jim Fry. <laughs> I got a little speech and a little award. You want? You can't hold it, yeah. Geez, you gotta have to build a new, whole new wing on your house. <laughs> Congratulations. But since uh, 1989, Wisconsin Rural Water Association has recognized operators in the state of Wisconsin that demonstrate excellence in the water and wastewater industries. So this award is presented to certified operators that work for the WRWA member systems to maintain regulatory compliance protect the environment and provide excellent service to their customers. On April 5th, 2023, the Operator of the Year Award was presented at the annual technical conference to the Hudson Utilities lead water operator, Jim Fry. Jim has been an integral part of the Hudson Utilities since he first started working here in 1980. Yes, 43 plus years and still going strong. In his tenure with the utility, he has seen Hudson grow from a small border town of a few thousand customers to over 9,000 accounts and growing. Nice job. <laughs> Being the lead operator, his current responsibilities include daily supervision of seven full-time staff members, oversight of numerous construction projects, sampling, customer questions, well rehabs, tower rehabs, project reviews, budget purchases, equipment maintenance, system maintenance, including the valve and hydrant exercising and GIS review to name a few. Boy, I didn't even practice reading this. <laughs> <laughs> a huge congratulations to you, Jim, uh, not only for your precious and well-deserved award, but your excellence in the field of municipal water supply. And it is greatly appreciated by all the residents of the city of Hudson. So on behalf of uh, the the uh, utility, here's your award. Does the audience want to see that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. 
you're fortunate I didn't prepare a speech, so it's going to be really short. <laughs> I've, re I've thoroughly enjoyed my career both in the water and the fire, working for the city of Hudson and the, and the residents here. And uh, so all I get to say, I, I have enjoyed it. It's been a great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, and then next we have the 2023 Arbor Day Proclamation, which uh, Council President Morissette will also read. Proclamation for Arbor Day for the City of Hudson. Whereas trees are among Hudson's most beautiful natural resources and bestow fine opportunities for aesthetic appreciation and recreation, as well as improvements for our homes and our public lands and are indispensable to our ecology as providers of wildlife habitat, erosion control, air filters, and noise inhibitors. And whereas Hutton has been named a Tree City USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation for 13 years in recognition of the outstanding efforts by the city and its residents to provide legal basis, financial investment, and community participation to support an ongoing program to planet nurture and routinely maintain and restore the canopy of trees. And whereas the demands on our environment and our environmental resources necess necessitated increased awareness of ecological values as well as an individual commitment to the study and the appreciation of trees and their maintenance, now therefore I, Acting, Pres or Acting Council President Randy Morissette, do hereby proclaim Friday, April 28th, and Saturday, April 29th, 2023, as Arbor Days in the city of Hudson and call upon all citizens to participate in the Arbor Day celebration and continue to support and protect our trees and woodlands. So, yeah, hey, thank you. Thanks, Randy. Aaron, I've got it, the, the PDF you just sent, so thanks. Yep. Uh, public hearings. <clears throat> public hearing related to 3rd Street, Laurel Avenue, Bluff Area Reconstruction Project Special Assessments. This is a public hearing. It's your opportunity to comment on this uh, agenda item. If you do have a comment, please step forward to the podium, uh, cite your name and address. Uh, do we have anybody on Zoom, Aaron, for this? Um, we do have one person on Zoom. Uh, Mr. Shaw, are you here for the uh, public hearing for the 3rd Street Laurel Avenue Bluff project? Mr. Shaw is muted. Sorry, I am here. Better? Yep. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Shaw, is this what you wanted to comment on? Well, I had a, I had several comments. Is it on this subject? Uh, certainly. That's why I called in. Okay. Um, let me just see. I, yeah, I had about four or five questions. One. The one I just wanted to make sure, of, which I think I am, is that the scope of the project, other than the retaining wall, is limited to removal and replacement of curb and gutter, uh, driveways and sidewalks. In other words, there's no excavation or intrusion into the bluff that is east of 3rd Street. No. No. Pardon? No, there isn't. Okay. Um, the, the second, I guess, comment that I had was, um, I saw the engineer's report that said, uh, decided against any one-way option, uh, notwithstanding, apparently, and I wasn't there, neighborhood comments suggesting that that should be strongly considered a year ago. Uh, in fact, the engineer says, the staff said, well, it would create a significant loop with delays, which of course, any change from a two-way to one-way would. And I guess I was surprised that 
you weren't at least open to considering an experimental test period of some period of time simply to see what the reaction of the neighborhood, including the so-called delayed people, were to that. And I, the reason I say that is that it, it clearly has been a safe, safety issue over the years. There have been at least two uh, uh, significant injury, well, not injuries, fortunately. A car went over and lost control and ended up in the Keys' backyard. And another one, I believe, was a rollover near the retaining wall. Um, one solution to that, obviously, and I don't know whether you consider it because it's not even addressed, is whether you might consider a speed bump on either side of the bend because that's where the problem is, as well as given the fact that you've seen the deterioration and the retaining wall. Um, the other, only other observation I would make is that there's been really no significant enforcement of load limits on the hill, which has also contributed to it, because you've got heavy trucks going up there and around, which itself is a safety issue. It, they come around that bend, and they're obviously taking up most of the lane. And they aren't supposed to go up that way or down that way, and they do. Those are just a couple of observations. Then I had a couple of, of, of kind of questions of methodology in terms of how the calculations were made, and maybe the engineer can answer these. or the staff, I guess. One is, I don't know whether it's standard because I don't pay much attention to projects as to whether it's such a large contingency, almost being 28% is top locked on to the actual construction costs in most projects. Here you've got a 10% contingency, which I assume wouldn't be refunded even if it came in within budget, maybe it won't. And there's a 15% engineering fee, as well as a $125,000 mobilization fee, an administrative fee, which takes up a lot, it seems to me, an ordinary amount of each person's assessments. Um, Hi, this, uh, this is Aaron. You know, engineer. for example, this, this engineering report was $330,000. Mr. Shaw, we have our engineer that would like to address this issue. Sure. Th thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, so for those, um, we did calculate the assessments with the construction um, as bid costs, so the prices we got from the contractor. So the contingencies um, of 10% and the engineering contingency listed would not be charged at the end. Um, so that's just added at the moment because these are still preliminary. They should um, be very close to this at the end. But if anything changes during construction, that would apply under our assessment policy. We would make that change in the calculation. So these are not the final numbers. The final numbers would come out um, after construction is complete and we have paid everything out. Um, so the 10% contingency would be gone. Okay, in so and is that standard of uh, in most of these construction contracts by the city that that you we get such a the, large, large percentage of engineering reports. Yes, we that um, I am newer to the Maybe city. it's your contract. Yeah, um, the engineering, uh, I don't believe is specifically part of the assessment policy. Um, so that is um, the project assessable amount for planning and administration would be charged. And the engineering costs, um, I would have to go over, I guess, with city staff and see how that has been applied to previous assessments because it's in, included in the calculations right yeah yep we yeah that all goes with the city's cost of the project so 
Um, in, in that regard, number one, I found one significant error in my assessment, which is parcel five in Appendix A. Uh, what, what about it? You know, if you look at the assessment summary, it shows curb and gutter administrative fee, which amounts to about $3,800, and you've got an assessment of $7,500. Yep, it's a little confusing, but if you look at the subtotal under planning and administration, you would only be charged the 566 uh, sorry, yeah, fifty-six dollars sixty-two cents for planning and administration. So how it's no, 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 I'm I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a four thousand five hundred dollar difference. Um, I'm not quite sure under parcel five under the parcel five says seven thousand one hundred and seventy-four dollars and thirty-seven cents, but if you look at what it's charged with. It's charged with curb and gutter in the amount of thirty-seven seventy-four eighty-three, and admit and a fee of fifty-six dollars and sixty-two cents, which only amounts to forty-three thirty-five seventy-five. Oh, yep. Okay. Yes, you are correct. So, um, we would would definitely correct that. Okay. Thank you. Since I am paying about thirty percent of the property yep, <laughs> assessments. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, although I am the largest property owner, so um, the other, the only other thing I would comment on, and I only did a sample, but I compared some of my parcel costs in the detail versus some of the other parcel owners in here, and I found variances for what ought to be, for example, you show the linear feet charge for curb and gutter times a unit cost. And, you know, you divide that, you ought to come up with a number. And that number ought to be the same. I mean, in terms of unit, and it's not, it varies not, not, well, I shouldn't say significantly, but it varies by over a dollar um, depending upon a particular parcel, which I, I mean, even it varies among my three parcels and, it, and I compared it with a neighbor and his was even less. Okay, well, we'll definitely, I know, um, we will just double check how everything is calculated in the spreadsheet and um, can make an amendment to the report. And, and when, will the, when will the assessments be actually finalized and published? Obviously when the construction's done. Yeah, when the construction, it's uh, planned to be a one year, well this construction season it should be over so we should know the final payments by the end of the year. And, then, and that's when it would be levied. I am. I this. I am new to the city, so I'm not sure the rest of the process for um, when they get applied. Yes. So once the project's done, we generally come back in, to the council with a final after all the project costs are done. In case there's change orders, whatever might have happened. Once we get that final, it generally comes back to the council for the final adoption of the assessments. And then at that point in time, that's when they get certified to the property. You get your notice that you can pay or get it um, added um, for a number of years, that sort of thing. And at that point, when a person gets a notice, if the person thinks it's an error or disputes it for whatever reason, what is their redress? Well, the, the time to appeal will be now. After, if the council moves forward with the with the project under the statute, the time to appeal uh, an assessment would be within the next ninety days. I, I believe it is. Uh, so okay. now is now is the time to correct anything in the spreadsheet that that might not be accurate. The the processing on the backside after it's done is only a truing up of the true costs related to the construction against what the assessment uh, was that was levied. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Aaron, do we have anybody else on Zoom? Aaron. 
Maybe. <laughs> Is there anybody else that wants to speak on this? Can I ask one question? Again, please uh, give your name and address. Yeah, my name is Mr. Anfinson at 1203 2nd Street. My only question was, I'm, I'm ignorant to the, the history of this project on 3rd Street, but I was just wondering if, if there was any talk or consideration on pedestrian thoroughfare on 3rd Street. Because when you get halfway up, there's no sidewalk. And, and some city planners, what they do is a two-way single lane with bike lanes painted on either side, and then cars just meander into the bike path. To make way for the two cars. Anyways, it was just a question. So. I can address that. Uh, I am serving on the Public Works Committee, and we had quite a few discussions about that last summer because we did try to uh, get this project going last year. Uh, there is there's certainly a narrowness of the street as a factor. One of uh, two things that are moving this project forward in general. One is the precarious uh, shape of the hillside there. Uh, the retaining wall needs to be rebuilt and supported, and so there was actually some breakdown of the asphalt. And the second thing is Hudson was lucky enough to get a grant specifically assigned to that street. So that helps us, I believe it's with State of Wisconsin funding. And so that's partly why we were moving forward, yet last year uh, the cost of asphalt made it prohibitive for us to even do even a modest amount of it. And also the engineering has been quite complex regarding uh, the retaining wall itself because it's a very challenging location and uh, really support, important support. So there was discussion about possibly having a bike pedestrian path and we actually just don't have right away or the funds to do it. So it's, uh, there's definitely a, a lot of interest in town, and we have a committee dedicated to that. They recently, the council usually recently accepted their guidelines and ideas for the future, but unfortunately that street is just, has not been deemed safe enough, wide enough, and we just don't have the funds to add. I mean, we were actually talked about having a cantilevered uh, walking pedestrian path, Additionally, going around that hillside corner, and it just is cost prohibitive for us. So we're looking at other ways of developing a bike route for people to go up the hill, bike and pedestrian. So thanks for bringing it up, though, because we definitely talked about it at some length. So that's my two cents anyway. Yep. Covers it. Mayor, right, I think that's thank it you. for the uh, public hearings. Any other comments? Oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. This is equipment. Hi, Jesse Bester, uh, 209 Third Street at the top of the hill there. Um, Jeff brought up a lot of good points. I was in the meeting last year when we talked about this, and Jeff seemed to bring up a lot of those points that we discussed last year. Um, I guess the two things that weren't really answered from the conversation last year, and maybe there's some meetings between then and now that I, I missed the invitation for or I would have been here, but the two that were, were, were the uh, concerns back then was one, and I think you brought it up at first, was the uh, like a seasonal speed bump to, to, to slow traffic coming around the corner. Um, we live, like I say, right at the top of the hill, and if we can't do anything about the pedestrian, just because there's no pedestrian way doesn't mean pedestrians don't use it. Right. And if you were to sit in our yard in the summertime, especially on the holidays or the main concerts downtown, and watch the parents with the kids rolling their strollers around the corner, or kids ripping down the street on those electric scooters, like there's got to be some way to slow traffic going around that corner. And I know we brought up this, even if it's a seasonal speed bump in the summertime so that the plows don't have to worry about in the wintertime. We brought that up last fall and he brought it up again in his, but he brought up a lot of points. Maybe it just got overlooked. But uh, what happened with the conversation with the speed bump? And then another thing from last year that we discussed is, um, I think, is it Miss K? I forget. This got conversations about the retaining wall and the cost per person on the hillside. And we sort of looked at, um, sort of a ballpark estimate of who's gonna pay what on the hillside. And just by the numbers of the last year, we're talking about like a 1% cost of the project that you guys are passing along to the people living on this hill to help fund the project. Like if you're talking 14 houses on the hillside at $3,000 average a house, you're talking like a 1% cost of the project. Why is that getting passed along to the people to save 1% on the cost, especially when you're getting a grant from the state of Wisconsin to help cover this stuff? And if we are getting this passed along, last fall someone brought it up. Um, how do you guys determine that? And is that sort of standard for every project in Hudson that 100% of the time you guys enforce this? Or is it 25% of the time? Or why is this one chosen for this? 
So that's my two questions is one to sort of clarify that and two the speed bump yep. thing. So the first one, um, actually the traffic calming policy, we're trying to work through a policy about how we determine what methods of traffic calming, including temporary speed bumps or bump outs, things like that, um, is going through the committees right now. So I believe public safety is going to be bringing it up soon. And once they have some recommendations, it's going to go to public works and then it's going to come to council. So we are talking about ways to have a policy so we can determine what's the best way, like in a complaint like yours on that curve, is it a, is it a temporary speed bump? Is it some other method of slowing things down. So we are working through that now. Um, so we should hopefully have something, I think, before the council, before summer. Um, and then on your second part, yes, the answer is, is we do uniformly apply our assessment policy to all of these projects. So we have a limited amount of things that we can actually assess in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but our policy is clear that for any of these sort of projects like this, we do assess the curb, gutter, um, is it sidewalk and driveway? Is that, that's basically all we assess. Um, so, it has been the policy of the city to always do that. Um, if at some on the second street project last year too, and then everything got divided. Everyone on that street got assessed as well. Yep, everybody got assessed in that one too. <laughs> they, yes, there were some pretty big ones there. Now there were there were some <laughs> unique situations with some like retaining wall issues as far as all over. We've talked about some retaining wall policies, but how do we deal with that? But as of right now, we've, we've been uniform with our assessment of, of doing that. And it is a small part, portion of the project. We don't disagree with that. Um, but it is the, the only really part that we can assess under statute and that we've been uniform with that. Now, if at some point the council wants to decide not to do that, that's a council you know, policy decision moving forward. Um, but at this point, we have universally applied that, including the Second Street project last year. Just one last follow-up on that. So at the end of this project, who's going to be responsible for check-in after they sort of do all the work on people's yards? For example, they did all the natural gas lines on that hillside and did sidewalks, and it's a mess this spring. It never got finished. I don't expect people are coming back to finish that. So when this gets done and they do our curb and then they sort of tear up our yard and they sort of spray some grass stuff on there and call it good, who's going to come at the end of this project like the one last time to make sure that it gets finished properly? The city will do that. And the good news with that is it's a city project, so we can actually do something. So the problems that we've had with some of our projects, if it's a state, a state project, we can't do anything. We have to get on WSDOT to come and get the contractor to come back and fix the right-of-way issues. Same with when you have a natural gas sort of issue. But if you have those things, let us know because we do get required permits <coughs> from private developers, so we can at least go back after them to try to get it. But for this one, because it is our project, we'll make sure before we release any sort of final payments, things like that, that it, all the restoration works complete. If the neighbors have any issues, if you let us know, we'll work to get them resolved, those sort of things. Believe me, I'll be on that. Mm -hmm. well, you know, all you gotta do is walk up the sidewalk and notice. It. It's not like this is a term, but just walk up the hill and see it. Mm -hmm. it's sort of I'll send the crew up, take a look at that, just for the issue with the natural gas. Although we're gonna hit it again here now, but yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments? Oh, yep, yeah, we have one more. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Carolyn Keys, I live at 101 Third, at the corner of the top of the hill. Um, two important things, the speed bumps, and I would also wonder about any weight restriction signs on Third Street. Um, I see everything that goes on. I have the yard that has the uh, crash cars through the front yard and um, accidents where I just cringe when I hear the, on weekends when I hear cars as fast as they're, it's kind of, I feel they're being promoted to go faster because it's fun. And especially if you've had a couple of cocktails and it's fun to speed around that corner. I've had friends tell me that. But I, if, you, if you could consider, please, uh, a weight restriction sign so there aren't semis. I understand there has to be utility vehicles, but I've seen them where they could barely get around. I mean, the very largest semis. It's concerning. And also the weight. As I grew up there in, in, in that spot, um, I can see where the weight is causing um, the road to kind of uh, sink. There's too much weight, too many large vehicles that go up around that corner. So those are my two concerns since there's no hope of having maybe a one way with a designated beautiful bike path for children and families. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments? Yep. Yep. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Vanessa Besser. I'm at 209 Third Street as well. And I'm just wondering if you can speak 
a little bit more to the safety committee and the process of getting the policy in place and the timeline that we're looking at and will that align with this project to ensure that when the project's done it's actually a safe place for people to live um, so I think I just saw the public safety agenda yeah. so I think it's on the agenda for this week yes the policy is on the public safety agenda for this week depending on what action they take it would go to public works at their next meeting which is I thought it didn't make it onto public safety this week. It's on this agenda. Yeah. It is? Public safety. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I, I think you're thinking of that the other topic of calming, traffic calming measures. That's a different issue. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was on here. Um, anyways, um, it, it'll go to public safety, it'll go to public works. The goal would be is that we'll have something in place, you know, by summer, so then we can start looking at how do we address the, the traffic calming sort of ideas that uh, are needed in some of the areas and what, what's the best way to decide. Where do you put speed bumps? Where do you do, as you've seen in 9th Street, we tried to do some of the little kind of pylons that go out to narrow the road artificially, things like that. So we're trying to decide which is the best options and then how for the council to decide which ones to use. And is there an opportunity for stakeholders, like people who actually live in the neighborhood to have input into that and how do you join the committee? Absolutely. Yeah, so basically what would happen is we, one of the things I think how we do it is we'd be asking for like if you have a stretch that neighbors have concerns out, they report it to the city, we'll let you know when we're gonna hear that we're going to talk about that conversation so you could come in then and, and provide some input on what here's what our options are what do you think are some best options for the neighborhood at least so you can have some input into it during the process is it input or just listening and then doing what um, those in control choose to do no you are you're allowed <laughs> to speak at the meeting and, and give input okay thanks for your comment vanessa any other comments any other comments? Any other comments? Move to close the hearing. Second. Got a motion and second to close the public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Public hearing is closed. Discussion of possible action regarding 3rd Street <coughs> Laurel Avenue Bluff Area Reconstruction Project Resolution 14 23, authorizing special assessments. Move to adopt resolution 14 23 with corrections and revisions to the math, if you will, <laughs> on, on each, if we can review each properties. Okay. Second. We have a motion and second to approve discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Consent agenda. Approve the meeting minutes from March 20, 2023, regular council meeting and April 18th, 2023, organizational meeting. Approve claims in the amount of $2,078,114.12. Approve the Valley Wide Pride Festival, June 17th, 2023. Approve booster days, June 29th, 2023 to July 2, 2023. Approve Hudson Lions Hometown Music Fest. Approval of a conditional use permit, reviewing application for a temporary garden center at 1800 Ward Avenue, Garden City, LLC. Approve the request for a reclassification of detective to detective sergeant. Approve a follow-up of review of Riverfront, Riverfront Square final development plans and certificate of compliance at 2020 or 22 First Street, former 106 Buckeye Street, Riverfront Properties, Inc. Approve a certified survey map extraterritorial zone town of Hudson at 593 Leonard's Road Hudson Dental Building LLC approve Star Observer as official newspaper approve the final development plans for 2221 Jack Bro Drive A and K Shirley properties approve the memorial application submitted by Luke Spivey approve the Lakefront Park Heritage banners design Approve the proposal from Studio EA in the amount of 19500 to provide architectural and engineering services to replace the Williams Park restroom. Approve the quote from Cyclone Fence in the amount of $18,855 to replace the retaining wall fence along 3rd Street. Approve a quit claim deed between the City of Hudson and Monarch Two Ventures LLC, 500 1st Street. 
approve letter of engagement with Bolton and Mink for construction phase services for 2023 Third Street Laurel Avenue Bluff area reconstruction project. Discussion and possible action to approve change order number one to replace curb and gutter on the Third Street Hill project. Discussion and possible action to approve change order number three for the old fire station demolition project and discussion and possible action to authorize staff to apply for Wisconsin DNR administered grant programs for trail rehabilitation. Move to approve. I'll second that. We have a motion and second to approve the consent agenda. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Wakefield? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Brock? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motion's approved. Consent agenda is approved. Uh, discussion. Uh, this is again, we're talking now on the liquor licensing, so there will be no action tonight. It's first reading. So, discussion uh, on ordinance 0 23, amending chapter 145 of the city of Hudson Municipal Code, exempting full service supermarkets and grocery stores from Class A fermented malt beverage and Class A intoxicating liquor quotas. Yep, so this is in front of the council. <clears throat> um, staff has been contacted by. Um, uh, multiple um, grocery store developers and each of them have requested to be allowed to sell liquor in the stores so this is the ordinance that would allow that to happen um, and it's in front of the council for discussion um, again you know we've we've brought this forward just because of the request of the developers um, for the council to decide if it's something they want to um, allow or not so that's really basically the history of it. Um, you can see from the ordinance what it would do. Um, basically, it would amend the ordinance right now um, for the Class A, um, which is basically allowing for the off-sale selling of beer, hard liquor, wine, pretty much everything, um, to happen um, in grocery stores, um, which we do not allow right now. Um, and it would exempt from it would exempt them from the current quota that we have, um, which we have set um, basically at. Uh, I think it's one for every 2,500 or somewhere right in that range um, uh, numbers that we have right now. So that's that's the basis of it. Yeah, and Aaron, if I could just add, just so that everybody has the, the same information. So Wisconsin has Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses for, for liquor. C is related to wine. Um, but A and B, A is off sale, B is on premises. The state sets quota requirements for Class B, so your restaurants, your bars, uh, there is a state quota that you apply. Class A licenses, there are no quotas. So you get to decide, cities and villages get to decide how many liquor stores or off-sale licenses that they want to issue. You have self-selected a quota of one per 2,500 residents. That's what your ordinance says today. And so the requests that are coming in from the grocers who are interested in locating in this community are asking if they can get a liquor license. And so what you have in front of you is a simple ordinance that would exempt grocers, meeting that 70% threshold for food sales, uh, prepackaged and, and whatnot, uh, to be exempt from your class A quota that, that you have self-imposed. So. When folks ask, well, you know, do we have another license available under the quota? That's really not what we're what we're talking about here. We're talking about exempting grocers from the quota that the council has set as a policy matter. I moved There's to discussion. What was that? Is there a discussion? I move to hold a public hearing on this issue. Our residents want another grocery store, but I think it's important to gather ideas on how to support and protect our liquor stores and get input um, uh, to, to this issue. I would second that. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Well, I'd like to make some comments in general. Uh, I was very disappointed that I knew nothing about this till the agenda was released last Thursday all of the public heard about it at the same time, as far as I know, perhaps other council members knew something. I do try to stay apprised of what different committees are doing and staff members, and I realize there's confidential projects that come before the staff that need to be evaluated, and there's meetings that um, I don't expect to be 
apprised of or aware of. I mean, there's a right to privacy, certainly for any business or developer that wants to come into town. But I think we are missing a big step here. Our ordinances call for a certain pathway for ordinance changes to happen. And I don't feel that this pathway has been followed. There's probably been other times that it hasn't been. But this time, I certainly agree with your recommendation that public hearing, I think we need mm -hmm. input. It's a major change that could uh, affect uh, you know, decisions have been made in the past for various reasons. Hudson is changing and growing, and we, we do need to look at all sides of an issue and take input. But I'm looking at our city ordinances 23-8, where it says, excuse me for reading it, reading and referral of ordinances and other matters. All ordinances, resolutions, communications, and other matters submitted to the council shall be read by title and author and referred to the appropriate committee by the mayor without motion unless objected to by a council member. The clerk shall read and record each reference by title and any older person may require reading in full of any matter at any time that's before the council. So I think, I mean, I appreciate the hard work that the staff does behind the scenes, but it's our job to make these ordinance changes and these recommendations. And so I don't object to starting with a public hearing. I don't know which committee, you know, our primary co committees, for those who may not know, are finance, public safety, and public works. So I don't know if there's a perfect fit for that, but I just, it, this is a significant proposal and a significant change. And again, I'm just disappointed that I didn't know anything about it until it was released on our agenda. In general, I would go to finance as we have in the past. Yeah, I would that. say finance would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Is, and I'm okay with a public hearing. That's fine. Let's talk about it and let people uh, throw their opinion into it. Uh, is this set in stone as under 3A, your 70% number? No, everything oh. open for so interpretation. So you could tighten it up where it would be more restrictive. Correct. And you can do a couple of different things. I mean, you, you have options, certainly. This is one way to deal with it in exempting grocers. You could look at your quota. If you wanted to look at your quota to, quota to look at the number of, of licenses that, that are available. Um, but certainly the, the committee is, is free to review and discuss what it wants to accomplish if, in fact, it does believe that a, that a change and, needs to be made. And, and Nick, some of the emails we got from proprietors in town we're opening up a Pandora's box. What is that box? What does that look like if we restrict it? Are we able to restrict it to as tight as we, as we can? Are we tied by law or a statue? No, you're, you're not, particularly with, with respect to your, your class A's. There's really no restrictions as to how you, how you deal with those. I would say as you kind of think through the number of licenses that you have though, um, if you simply take the step to increase the number of Class A licenses, you might have other applicants out there that, that come forward. I think mm -hmm. you know certainly in, in working with staff throughout this process, a lot of this is driven by the inquiries that, that you're getting in the community from grocers that want to come in. This community has a long-standing practice of not allowing um, malt beverages, beer, uh, or liquor to be sold in gas stations and convenience stores. And I think that was some of the thinking in terms of how do you, how do you look at this from the most narrow perspective to potentially address what is coming before the city. Um, and certainly the intent was to have a discussion here with, with the council to say how do you you know, how do you want to see this to, to move forward, understanding that we do have long-standing tradition of, of really protecting liquor stores in, in this community. Uh, we don't protect, to my thought or knowledge, much of any industry, uh, but we have these protective ordinances currently that, that protect liquor stores and, and limit those uh, liquor licenses, but, which is just fine as a as a policy matter. But you know now as as we're evolving with the times and you see additional needs and and requests, the question is how do you how do you deal with them, 
and how do you work through them? Yeah, and Hudson, and, for, I'm sorry, sir. I was just going to say, in addition to protecting the liquor stores, I also see that as a public safety um, for controlling how much access we do have out in our community. Um, so that's another perspective to think about as well. Um, and with this current, with what was brought forward, am I understanding this correctly? So it's not um, just this, the new grocery store that's considering the development. This would be open for county market, Aldi's, Fresh and Natural, any of those grocers, and there's no limitations on how it's read at the moment. So any one of them could. If so we could have that, four. If they can meet the requirement of the 70%, 30%, as it's written now, yes. Correct. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And I and I'm just was going to say that, not speaking for my colleagues here, but I think we've all heard we need another grocery store in Hudson, and Hudson has no, always had a, more than one grocery store. I think the many might outweigh the few at this time, and I'm not suggesting anything, but we need a grocery store, <laughs> and and whether they can fit within our community with or without what we do with our ordinances shouldn't matter if they want to really come here they'd come here well and that's what I'm saying is I can't promise you that if you pass this that a grocery store comes right. I can't promise you that if you don't pass it that one still doesn't come um, you know it is possible that they still will all we're doing is letting you know that this is what we're hearing from them is that they want to see this change made which is why it's here for the council to have this conversation um, and I think in I would be looking for clarification, well, maybe not even clarification, but with a situation like this, generally what we do want to do is bring it to the full council. Um, there's really not a committee that necessarily handles this, this sort of issue, and because it is such a large policy issue, if the council doesn't want to pursue it, it doesn't have to get referred to committee and it can just die. But on an issue like this, staff generally does not just send it to a committee first, because I have no idea if the council supports this or not. The mayor sends it to the committee. <coughs> but that's, it has for to ordinance. come here first. Right, for ordinance. Right, right. so Discuss when you were saying this is the first time you've heard this, yeah. where would you have liked to have heard it before, I guess is my question. Yeah. Because I don't know where else to sure. bring it first sure. because we don't generally send things directly to committee. It comes here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, the council. It would have gone to right, and then it gets passed along to a committee that way. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that it has to come up at some point, and sure. I don't know any other way to do it but bring it to council and, and have you see it. I'm now, wondering. if you'd like something different moving forward, we could sure. talk about how you want to do that. Okay. <coughs> the part for me that um, was just a little surprising, too, was that we saw it on Thursday night. I hear what you're saying, but I think it was the possible action. So perhaps if it had been brought forward as just discussion, um, maybe, maybe that would have been a way that would have felt better and a little bit more transparent. I don't know if transparent is the right word, but just giving people a chance to be present and make their voices heard. So understanding what the mayor said, if we are not going to revisit this until the second meeting in May, well, we're going to do a public hearing potentially I was going to say, it. there's two yeah. different items yeah. here. You yeah. can do a first reading tonight, or you can instead, the motion on the floor right now is to hold a public hearing first instead. Yeah. Because again, it is fully up to the council to decide what to do with these things. These are the policy decision sort of things. Absolutely. So you don't even have to have a first reading of this ordinance if you don't want one. It's not a requirement to have a, a first reading of the ordinance. You can n not motion it. You can motion to have a first reading and have it denied, and then it's just it's just done. Um, so if you have a if you would like to have a public hearing first before having that discussion, then what I would say then is tonight don't do a first reading of this ordinance. I would say if you if the motion on the floor is to have a public hearing. I would say set the public hearing first. Have your public hearing. After that point, we can have on the agenda this discussion item again, and you can decide if you want to have a first reading, if you want to do what we've right or wrong, pretty much been doing nonstop, is waive the reading mm -hmm. and just go ahead and approve. Um, you can do that as well. Um, so you have all the options still at that point. And I, I just want to add that with the amount of feedback I've received from the public, it is clear we need to have public hearing before anything else happens. Um, and it wasn't just a yes, I'm a for, or no, they were all one way, and very specific in their concerns. And 
well thought out in their concerns as well. So I, I really feel like before we do anything else, that public hearing has to be something that's done first. Yeah, I agree with that. Prior to the the first reading, or if there would be a first reading after that, um, you know, I, I think there's a great exercise of how we're hearing all of us in the city and you know Facebook and in newspaper, whatever. We need another grocery store or two as an option. Um, and of course, the city doesn't build grocery stores, um, so the the staff is literally looking for creative ways to bring to make it more attractive to bring in more grocery stores or whatever the subject may be. Um, so that job, well done. That's a, this is an interesting way to maybe make it more attractive to outside people coming in. However, you know, as it's written, I, I don't like it, um, and I and I think that that there needs to be more options than just this locked and loaded uh, statement that we're seeing right here in front of us. So um, I'm all for a public hearing, and then maybe tinkering with this, or like you say, or letting it die. Um, we we are an evolving city. Um, changes do happen, but we can control that in smaller chunks than maybe just this big whitewash that's right here so well, i've got some comments. all right we've got a motion and no. a second before us for public hearing i still have some person? comments um oh sorry joyce <laughs> i was waiting for everybody else to make their comments before because i um a little bit of history is that i you know i don't know that we were protecting liquor stores so much as we were keeping the police from having to too many liquor stores to um keep an eye on given the differences between minnesota law and wisconsin law and the history of that you know through the 70s and um and even th recently with the um the sunday liquor store sales so um but um Anyway, could we do instead of a percent? Could we do? Could we limit square feet um, allotted to a to, to liquor sales? So I just I I, I appreciate your comments, Joyce. The, the motion right now is just for a public hearing. But here's what I'd like to do: once we take a vote on the public hearing, then let's have a further discussion if that's okay. Okay. All right. So, is there any other discussion or comments on a public hearing motion? I would like uh, some expert advice on whether it's best to have our ordinance. I mean, there's been some suggested changes. Should we work on that more before we ask for public input, or should we just have a public hearing to hear general ideas? What's the best route? I mean, I would think at this point, as we've said, the ordinance can be whatever you want it to be. This is not dictated by state statute. This is dictated by local ordinance. So if there are ideas out there that the public might have that the council may want to take into consideration, while we craft it, I would say then you probably want to have the hearing first to hear if anybody has any ideas with it. It may just be that we're opposed completely or we support completely, um, but you never know. You might have some people that would say, well, yeah, but what if we limit it to this? Or So I would say you'd probably want to hear just to see just general input, general input from helpful. the public first okay and i would assume that would then help you craft any sort of changes if you want to make it moving forward okay i, I would agree with that and i i think it's the the public the public hearing needs to be in the context of the city has been contacted by grocers who would potentially like to locate in this community but who have asked for a liquor license and we have a restrictive uh, ordinance structure that doesn't make that possible right now mm -hmm. and so that the question is should the city make liquor licenses available for grocers that want to come into town and, and to locate uh, you know I, I think that's really the the question because we're not looking at gas stations and convenience stores oh. we're not looking at changing the quota just to change the quota to offer more licenses it's really kind of a narrow question that that centers on you know if if a grocery store wants to come to town should the city be willing to accommodate a liquor license request i think that's what we're trying to get to as part of the discussion that you want to have with the with the public all right everybody good yep all those in favor of the motion aye, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. 
Can I clarify? Uh, so can we do the hearing at? I would recommend that we do it at the second May meeting, considering that our first May meeting is next week, just to give us a little time in between. <laughs> um, so that way we can get it posted. Uh, should be able to get it in the paper still. Um, but we should be able to get it published at least then still for the second May meeting to get a little, have a little more time for people to be notified and also if there's ideas for people to think of some ideas and, and, and things like that. I hate to just have a turnaround of really one week. So is that okay for the second May meeting? Agreed. Yep. And for the folks that are here, that's May 15th, correct? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. I don't have a calendar probably, but yeah, because our, our May 1st, so yeah, it would be uh, May, 15th. May 15th. Yep, so it would be at the May 15th meeting. All right, so we'll have a public hearing May 15th, and then we're back to the uh, discussion on the agenda item. Joyce? Okay, so the, my question was, instead of a percentage, could we limit to a certain number of square feet? You can do whatever you want. Again, like we were saying, for the <laughs> yeah. most part. Okay. As long as it's something that's measurable, though. So one of the things that we've tried to avoid doing with our controllable things is like talk about like um, gross sales and things mm -hmm. like that, because that gets difficult. Because then we're relying on the on the a retailer to provide us with data, or then we're trying to have to verify if it doesn't seem right, and we're mm -hmm. trying to compare it to sales tax data. So we'd rather avoid things that make it difficult for us as a city to actually enforce. Okay. So that's where I like to stick to square footages. Something um, easy to track. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. like that, where we don't have to have multiple other things that we have to research to try to figure out if it's accurate or not. But, but the other piece of it too is that with all, as with all ordinances, we can't pick winners and losers, right? right? So you know, if we know that we have a, a category of users that might want a license, we can't say, well, you get one, but you don't. If, if we're going to create an ordinance that allows for licensure, then we have to make licenses available to anybody that fits within that, that definition. So, you know, we can't just say, well, you know, we can give one grocery store a license, but not other grocery stores. And, and that's kind of the, that's the magic of drafting ordinances and kind of thinking about where you want to go. If you want to limit it to square footage so that you've got smaller retail operations and that's what you're what you're interested in permitting or if you want to limit it in some other way we can do that it's just going to apply to everybody that fits your definition and that is eligible under that definition so Aaron and I had a conversation this afternoon and I just want to um, pull up some of the high points so that the public knows what um, some of the questions that I asked and some of the answers to it. So, um, all right, so currently there is a license for a liquor store available, is that correct? I, I haven't been able to verify with Becky that if we have any Class A's left or not right now. I don't know that we do. Um, so she's checking on that, but we Karen don't. said we don't. Okay, so we don't have any right now. But, but it, the the ordinance says that it's um, one for every 2,500 2, residents or any portion thereof, which would mean that there we we are above 15,000, so we should have seven licenses available, and we have six liquor stores. Is there is there a license that we're not aware of? And that's what I wanted to check with Becky. I'm not sure, because Nick, I believe Becky did reach out to you at some point about look, we're over 15,000 now, do we have this extra license? I think we had that conversation when we got you know, earlier this year. So that's what I wanted to verify, and Becky's out on yes. leave right now. So when I can yeah. talk to her, I will verify if there's okay. another one yeah. available right now. But mm -hmm. we do have six out right now, mm -hmm. but based on the fact that our latest census estimate from the, from the state of Wisconsin was over 15,000, it's potentially that we do have one available that seventh one so in minnesota they have um a separate store for the the liquor store so for example hy V, they do have a liquor store attached to the the store but it is separate and so under our current um ordinance if a store wanted to do that where they had a separate liquor store away from the grocery store they could do that um, as long as they kept things separate. And there's a license available. 
and there's a license available. Yep. As long okay. as you have the separate entrance, in our ordinance even says that right now. It's in our ordinance and it's very specific that if you're basically a grocery store and you want to apply for a class A, you have to have a separate entrance, has to be a separate, um, like how you check out, everything has to be, you know, you know, completely separate from the store itself. So we do, we do delineate that in our ordinance right now, but it would have to mean that there is a license available. Okay. Um, or they would have to acquire a license to be able to do that. Okay, so um, I think most of the other points have already been brought up. Um, I think though that um, one thing that is important to, for for the council to realize is that grocery stores have about a 1% margin, profit margin, and so they have to have a large volume of sales in order to be profitable. And so a liquor license is could be important to that because there would be a higher profit margin on the liquor and so um, that's something that we need to take in, into account um, however I do want to say that you know I'm um, you know, I do want to be one of the things that I've run on is is the small town atmosphere and keeping this the small town atmosphere and so I, I this is a, a tough um, decision uh, for us but um, the the local liquor stores have been um, very good about supporting the community. So, for example, um, last year for Rotary, I was the uh, I volunteered to ask all of the liquor stores to make a, a donation to the um, the golf outing and um, some bottles of wine or some um, cocktails or something like that. And all of the liquor stores in in the city and in North Hudson gave generously. And so, you know, I want I appreciate that and wanted to preserve that. So this is a real difficult uh, decision. But I think that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Joyce, thank you. Uh, you raised some uh, really good points, some good questions. Uh, I was thinking along the same line with respect to the 70%, 30%, because, and Aaron, you brought it up. How do you verify that? And, uh, and even if you could, the enforcement issue is what happens if that gets skewed? You're going to shut them down? You know, and so... Uh, there, there are some tough questions here, as you pointed out, Joyce, and uh, and I thought some, you know some very thoughtful points that you made. Anybody else? Well, I want to comment just briefly. I also feel like I want to be supportive of our small local businesses, and that that's important. That um, they and I do actually know a person quite well who does make the liquor stores in Hudson a destination because he's a bourbon aficionado and <laughs> likes to see what are, is on the shelves here in Hudson as opposed to where he lives in Minnesota. But uh, so people, <laughs> you know, that's an important part of our town and I can see how it can be construed that we're protecting that industry. I think because we're a border town and all the history that goes back to, you know, when different drinking ages in two different states and all those issues that that led to this establishment of we only need so many and certainly as someone mentioned I think it was you about Joyce about uh, law enforcement yes uh, being engaged on um, in issues now that uh, the state of Minnesota allows uh, liquor sales on Sunday has definitely changed things before you know people you could just see them streaming across the interstate to pick up a six pack or whatever it might be on Sunday because you know the stores were closed in Minnesota so there's been those border issues and I, I do think it is we do have to acknowledge that Hudson is growing I do also support and want to support new businesses coming in we have buildings that are unoccupied and lots that are empty and yes there's a, a lot of interest in Hudson and that is our difficult job of guiding it and making those decisions so I do appreciate the time to talk about it more and the public hearing will be helpful I I do want to just comment if I'm not mistaken that when we do have a public hearing will that be open to non-residents or will it be limited to only it's a it's a non-statutory public hearing okay. so as of right now it's only for residents only residents okay thank but you. that is something that the council can okay. always revisit because sure. again that's one of our policies mm -hmm. so if the council would like to allow anyone to speak on it that would take a, a council decision okay. to be able to do that something maybe for the mayor to consider ahead of time or or business owners we yeah. we also own, sure business we, owners we yes. also allow the business owners too okay. so technically if you don't live in town but you own a business oh. in town we do allow that sure so that sounds good 
And if I could just make one final final point, and that's all I have until we actually get into uh, the meat of, of, of doing the ordinance. Um, I want us to make sure that we're mindful of our comprehensive plan where and the economic portion, which is that fine line of balancing new growth, but also a real protection of our current uh, businesses that are there too. That is under, if people want to look at it um, as we're putting this in mind and filing, filing, filing it away at 7.5. So just encourage folks to consider that as well. All right, everybody ready to move on? Yep. Nope. Thanks for your comments. Uh, let's see. Uh, discussion of possible action setting a public hearing date for a zoning map amendment from is that I, uh, Industrial One Light Industrial to B4 Central Business District at 727 Second Street Operation Help. Plan, uh, I can finish this up, I guess. Plan Commission voted 3 to 2 to forward a recommendation of the Common Council to set a public hearing date for June 19th, 2023, regarding the rezoning application made by Operation Help and Studio EA. So basically, this is just setting a public hearing date for it. It doesn't do anything other than allow for input, public input on this before the council takes it up for, for any further discussion. So moved. Second. Got a motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Setting of special meeting to discuss CIP project prioritization. So this was something that was brought up a few months ago now about wanting to have a conversation. When we approved the CIP for 23-24, uh, um, we had a conversation a little bit about how do we prioritize projects, what should we do with that? Um, and so uh, this would be just setting that date. We wanted to give our city engineer a chance to get started and to review everything that our past city engineer did and <laughs> be able to provide her input on to how we've prioritized projects, things like that. So what we would do with this meeting would basically be run through how we've prioritize projects, where we at with our big long list of things we need to do, um, and then how we identify ones that we move forward and recommend in our CIP for the immediate future, then out to five years right now. So that's what this, the, the point of the meeting is. I figured it'd be the easiest just to have everybody talk while they're in the same room and figure out when you want to do it. Right. And the discussion was to have a special standalone meeting for this, so. Are you hopeful that we'll pick a meeting date? Yeah, Tonight? that'd be great. That's my goal. Okay. <laughs> In what month? In May. <laughs> May would be great. Well, I wanted to suggest um, Monday, May 8th, unless that is too soon for people. It's a couple weeks away. Uh, it would keep the continuity of us meeting on Mondays. Mm -hmm. We are all going to be here, but just focused on one issue. We do have a public works meeting that evening at 5, but it should, should be done easily. By then, we could meet at 7. I don't know how other people look at that date. I'm open for the 8th, so that would be fine. Yeah. That's Eight fine. at 6. 6 would probably work. Yeah. 6 would work. Okay. Um, that's fine with me. We're good with it. May 8th at 6 p.m.? Everybody good with that? Do you need a motion or? No, that's okay. fine. And that was 6 o'clock? Yep. Okay. Sounds good. All right, everybody good on that? Uh, closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19.85 sub 1 sub G for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel concerning a strategy to be adopted by the council with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved. Notice of claim for EMS fund distribution and uh, are we going to do them? Might as well do them both at the same time, right? Yes. Uh, closed session pursuant to Wisconsin section 19.35 sub G for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel for the city to discuss strategy regarding pending litigation. And that is Hudson Mills Fleet Farm versus the city of Hudson for property tax appeal. Move to go into closed session. Second. I have a motion and a second to go into closed session. Roll call. Where is that? Yes. Wakefield? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Brock? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motion's approved. We're now in closed session. All right. Everybody good? So we're back in open session. Do we have a motion? Um, motion to approve resolution 14-23. Sorry. That's second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Motion, Motion to deny to settlement time. request by Hudson Mills Fleet Farm. Second. All right, we have a motion to second any discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. I don't have anything, anybody? Move to adjourn. Second. Got a motion second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. We stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so the first time.